Uh, I'm, I'm coming from, uh, to you from sunny Florida, where it is a fall break right now, so I'm not in Louisiana right now. Uh, I also want to thank the two Lilies uh, for inviting me, especially Lily Cheng for inviting me to give uh, share my research with all of you. I want to also thank Elizabeth, Yudan, and Mu Ting to sort of help making sure everything sort of goes well and keeping me on track and on time as well. I, of course, I also want to uh, thank my colleague, Patricia, for uh, responding to my talk. And I look forward to Bob, Patricia, and all of your uh, <coughs> suggestions and questions for my talk. So I will begin. Thank you. As somebody who was born and raised in the older part of the city of Guangzhou, or in, sometimes in English known as Canton, I would explore alleyways and side streets on my own time, getting lost but often surprised by what I could find there. Like so many Chinese cities in the past decades, the rapid development and expansions of Guangzhou has swallowed up neighborhoods, villages, and many historical structures. Year after year, as I returned to my home city, I would take note of the changing landscapes and even more so, precariously holding onto what was left. Ornamental remnants of old structures reincorporated into somebody's living quarter or lonely temples or shrines that used to be the center of an entire community. Now obscured by the rising skyscrapers popping all over, all around them. Wo Gong Miao was such a building. Located in the former town of Foshan, now uh, designated as a city, just west of Guangzhou. This was a temple and a guild hall for iron nail makers, one of the several types of iron making crafts industry that flourished in Foshan during the Qing dynasty. Next. The narrow alleyway just in front of the temple, uh, standing in a narrow alleyway just in front of the temple, I try to step back and crane my neck, uh, uh, crane my neck <coughs> scanning the ornamental stone facade. I was delighted to be greeted by a pair of cherubic smiling faces. Next. Tucked away in the supporting beams, these clown-like figures stood out. Their faces were distinctive and their costumes uniquely different than the surrounding deities. They had the feature of a Western foreigner, generally European in origin, but may also refer to somebody from the United States. Note the butterfly-like bows underneath their chins, the rolls of the roll of circular buttons that runs down the front of the long jacket, the large nose and eyes, and the raised top hat. Next. To make these features easier to see, I'm bringing in these uh, another uh, a pair of architectural fragments on display at the nearby Taoist Temple Zoo now, and these are almost certainly made contemporaneous and perhaps at the same workshop as the one we just saw themselves salvaged from another structure in Foshan that is no longer extent. The resemblance of the Guogong <coughs> Miao and Zhu Miao figures suggest they came from the same workshop. Next slide. Since my encounter with Guogong Miao more than a decade ago, I have noticed the decorative motifs of foreign, foreigners appearing on different me in different media and in different contexts from domestic architectural fragments to export art. Next slide. To utilitarian goods such as the chamber pot and candlesticks. Next slide. To Thanksgiving plaques, altar offering stands, to wooden carving found on altars. They follow wherever Cantonese immigrant migrants went, sometimes all the way to a mining town in Northern California. Uh, 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 named Oroville in the example on the left. I want to note again that the examples I'm fo focusing all came from Guangdong, which were related, but it is considered separately here because of the manner of representation and the intended audience different from those at the Qing court, a topic that I will, uh, I will turn to a little bit later. Current explanation for these figures found on museum labels and plaques on the sites in China, repeat near verbatim the official narrative of the Communist Party. These were, 
these were local Cantonese expressions of anti-imperialist sentiments against foreign aggressors in the aftermath of the Opium Wars. This, despite the fact that a number of the datable figures had dates that preceded the Opium Wars of the 1840s and 60s. Even in the works that were made after the Opium Wars, many of the smiling faces convey a sense of playfulness and disarming charm. I do not think the anti-imperialist reading is incorrect, but the, that explanation grossly exaggerated and over, o, overly generalized <clears throat> the, the issues at hand. We need a closer look at some of these figures. In this paper, I will begin to revise this interpretation by offering some additional reading based on the historical, sociological, architectural context for the individual figures. By applying theories of ornaments and caricature, I will seek to shift the power relationship between the subject and object, the viewer and the decorative motif, and reorient the discussion on the nature of the representation of the other. When I deal with these materials, I often face several challenges. Can I have the next slide? First, few provide reliable data. These are the only examples, actually, in fact, there's one more that I couldn't fit into the slide, are the only examples where I have a specific date attached to the object. Thus, an attempt to create a straightforward narrative about the stylistic development would not be possible. There are hints about the changes in style, especially, uh, for example, in the, uh, the example that I came to study at the San Diego Historical Museum on the right from 1899, note these much looser and more modern costumes found on the foreigner uh, on the side of this uh, base. Next slide, please. Second, the differences in style cannot be explained away by dates or variations in the medium. <clears throat> Some of the stylistic variations were clearly the results of different workshop practices. Foshan and San Yuanli are basically next door in, to each other as, these, as suburbs west of Guangzhou. Others, such as examples made from the region of Cha Chaozhou and Shantou in the northeastern corner of Guangdong province, were likely to be the result of regionalism, such as the ones seen in the center. Chaoshan region was famous for this particular style of recarving that has a much closer affinity to Fujian province to the north rather than the Guangdong province to the south. Therefore, my discussion of the figures will be grounded in general observations and the application of theoretical frameworks to reclaim these often neglected and marginalized subjects and begin to mediate on the nature of cross-cultural representations. There's been a long history, of, sorry, not, <laughs> there's been a long history of representing outsiders in China. Next. Representations of foreigners can be dated to at least the Han Dynasty. These freestanding figures were part of the above ground structure of tomb shrines. Art historians such as Zheng Yan has interpreted them as either depictions of immortals or guardians. Next. The most famous representations were found during the Tang Dynasty, where the increased interaction um, along the Central Asian trade routes and territorial expansion into the same ter uh, region brought a popularization and proliferation of images depicting people from the West. In this case, here in reference to present day Northwestern China and Inner Asia. Characterized by their, quote, deep eyes and high noses, end quote. These exotic figures were often portrayed as entertainers who dance and sang. Next. This particular, stere this particular stereotypical portrayal lingered into the Qing Dynasty in works such as this, part of the imagined West used to legitimize the centralization of imperial power. Next. And this is where I will turn toward next. There was another type of representing uh, foreigners <clears throat> at the Qing court that is slightly uh, different from the one that we have been looking at. 
<clears throat> with a perhaps less direct link to their past. In fact, as several historians have suggested, the systematic production of encyclopedic knowledge of the verifiable and knowable other was made in, in the service of a particular type of imperial purview. The purpose of projects such as Zhigong Tu, seen here, was to construct and to order the non-Manchu and non-Han others within the Qing borders and beyond. Next. And to provide a grand view, imaginary scenes of cosmologically panoptic perspective through courtly tribute paintings such as this. Next. Ethnic differences emphasized by their costumes and their local tribute products were meticulously put on full display. In this perfect, perfected Sinocentric, Sinocentric world, foreigners are the bearer of exotic goods, vessels of faraway places and well wishes. Next. The reality of course is more was more complicated from the 18th to 19th century, Guangzhou was in a unique position as the only port in China that was allowed to trade with the West. Traders and visitors from Europe and the United States created an enormous demand for the arts, which artisans and workshops in Guangzhou were happy to comply, specifically creating works that cater to their tastes. In turn, Export artisans in Guangzhou threw, drew their inspirations from diverse, their diverse arsenal of materials, techniques, and models, which included inspiration from the Qing court. That is why we have export paintings that were modeled after the imperially commissioned work, such as <coughs> uh, the detail on the left from Zhigong Tu. The direction of artistic idea also flowed the other way as well, with the court employing many artists and artisans from Guangzhou. Next. Thus, the domestic representation of foreigners found on Cantonese temples as seen on the left, lightly derived from popular depictions of foreigners as informed by of Qing court paintings from local sources is further evidence of this exchange of artistic ideas and practice between the court and the coast. As, and this, as this is something that has been observed by the art historian Craig Kunis and others. There is a demonstration on the fluid circulation of popular motifs within the artistic network between Chinese metropoles in the 19th century. Next. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Foreigners from Europe and the United States trading or visiting Guangzhou would have com <coughs> would commission Cantonese artists to artisans to make individualized works such as these colorfully painted clay portrait figures. In addition to provide yet another source of inspiration for the artisans imagining what a foreigner looked like, they also exaggerated many features. Note the bulging eyes the flat circular buttons, for example, in the, in the uh, Cantonese, uh, in the Foshan example on the left. While updating others, the top hat, for example, was a contemporary feature of a man's formal wear in the first half of the 19th century. Recently, portrait figures such as the gentleman on the right has been the subject of intense research interest by scholars such as Roberta Wu, Winnie Wong, Lai Yuzhi, paying close attention to their verisimilitude a stylistic trait also found in many export artwork intended for a foreign audience. Here, I argue the most lasting impact resided not in the formal likeness as model of an authentic other, but as a template or a model that allow for an interpretation specific to the local condition and local audience. Where then can we locate the source of these exaggerated characterizations found, uh, find, found on, the, on these foreigners? We not need not to look very far. Next. Returning to the cross beam from Foshan Su Miao, all we need to do is shift our attention toward the center. Here we see the pair of a pair of golden boy and J girl, Jin Tong Yu Lu typical folk divinities found on these architectural fragments, 
unfurling a scroll that provides the date of the work, 1834, and the shop that it came from. Other than the top hat, bow, and buttons, the Paris bears a remarkable resemblance to the foreigners at both ends of the, of the crossbeam, including the position of their legs. Next. The physiognomy of the foreigner also share many similarities to other auspicious figures in stone or in polychrome glaze earthenware decorations found in the region. Next. In fact, I want to bring your attention to this comparison <coughs> to Liu Haichan, a glazed earthenware figure to ornament temple's roof from Shiwan Kiln, also for at Foshan, with other foreigners from the cross beam. One could explain the similarities by pointing to the practice of modular production at the ceramic or stonemason workshops. But that explanation, in my opinion, is insufficient. Next. Examples are also found with foreigners unfurling banners. At Guogong Miao and at, Chinese at the Chinese temple in Oroville, notably a a pair of Americans with prominent sideburns and a top hat supported by a golden, auspicious, auspiciously golden cloud, hold on to the end of a scroll that gave thanks to the temple and also marking the donors who gave that, uh, that plaque. It is clear that foreigners were an integral part of the architectural uh, decorative motif, uh, program, one that is not tied to a specific narrative moment and most often than not, temple decorative programs were filled with rebuses or illustrations of famous scenes from histories or operas. Next. They may have been another predecessors in these foreign figures as well. Yakshas are powerful figures often found at the base of pagodas or statues or Buddha statues. These strong men are often portrayed as non-Han foreigners, but this is especially apparent in Guangdong, where there have been a long history of contact with people from the, uh, from, from the ocean. These foreign-looking yakshas are found in several sites in Guangdong at the base of pagodas, some datable to the Ming Dynasty. Though their physiognomy and costumes may reference earlier stereotypes, about foreigners other than Europeans, the otherness from uh, the Han Chinese is unmistakable. The facial, gestural, functional resemblance of the European foreigners to folk divinities, such as Buddhist yakshas, Liu Hai Chan, <coughs> the golden boys and jay girls, the He He immortals, He He Er Xian, <clears throat> or the immortal of the harmonious and union, harmony and union, demonstrate that in fact these stereotypical vision versions of foreigners have also become a semi-divine, have also become semi-divine auspicious figures. The otherness or foreignness, a mark of their newly elevated status as minor divin, uh, deities. Next. Like the foreigners in the painting tribute bearers from 10,000 nations coming to court, they were bearers of fortune and wealth. For many, and for many members of the community that use these temples in Foshan or in Oroville, these non-Han Chinese were both a curse and a blessing, though the latter contribution, though only the latter contribution was visible in, uh, on the temple. However self-assured and aggressive they were in Qing Guangdong or outright racist in the United States, these non-Chan Chinese foreigners were also the sor sources of wealth and prosperity. Like Guangzhou, the various, the various <laughs> sorry. Like Guangzhou, the various industries in Foshan, including iron making, the trade that Guogong Temple was, de uh, was devoted to, benefited greatly from the presence of foreign traders, either directly through export that included Shiwan ceramics or indirectly through the increased overall demands for materials. So how should we readjust our reading of these figures? Next. 
it is important to note that they are indeed often interposition of support, such as these pillar bases. Next. They held candles, offerings, or parts of a building. Next. Yet, but th yet they're not in a position of subjugation, as often repeated by so many uh, scholars from China, especially in comparison to these truly subjugated demons found at the Fengxian Temple at Longmen, where this contorted figure, a sort of symbolic representation of obstacle to enlightenment, is in a state of agitation, being crushed by the guardian king of the north. Next. The important things to note here is that they are at the margin. They're often hard to spot without really looking for them. In this way, they reenact the real life situation that many foreign traders in Guangzhou had uh, until the First Opium War. Being confined to a small strip of land just outside of the city wall in, uh, in, uh, in Guangzhou. The motif of the foreigner plays a supporting role. They're ornaments. Scholars from Ananda Kumaswamy to Michael Camille have argued the importance of ornaments across time and cultures. Ornaments frame, point, direct, position, and comment on the central subject. Writing on the nature of ornaments, the art historian Oleg Graybar called the relationship between works of art and, uh, and viewers, quote, intermediaries, end quote. They are, quote, agents that are not logically necessary to the perception of a visual message without which, but without which the process of understanding would be more difficult. Because these intermediary agents facilitate or even compel access to the work of art by strengthening the pleasure derived from looking at something." End quote. While the foreign figures can easily become lost in the overabundance of ornamentation on the facades of temples, filled with very similar looking deities, rebuses, and other auspicious symbols, their mere presence signal a particular type of social capital that even if we no longer have the knowledge or the correct context to decipher them today. Next. In some examples, I was able to find the attempt to belittle or denigrate uh, is perhaps a bit clear. The depiction of a foreigner, supposedly the image of a Harry Park, uh, who played a pivotal role in the Second Opium War. Uh, and by the way, uh, for, from my eye, this looks nothing like Harry Park, and there are plenty of historical photos that you can find online. Uh, I didn't want to put it here to sort of further uh, uh, create that sort of illusion at the identification of this as Harry Park. <clears throat> uh, who play a pivotal role in the Second Opium War as a chamber pot, has a humorous and subversive message that perhaps is hard to miss. Yet the beguiling smile and the lighthearted gestures are difficult to reconcile with the negative interpretation we would like to read onto this image. I would refer to these images as caricatures. Caricatures function through distortion and exaggeration, reducing and generalizing the other through overloading them with immediately legible signs. Yet they're also contextually specific. It can only happen in Guangdong, where there's a long history of interaction with foreigners, coupled with a vibrant art artisan workshop uh, with vi art, vibrant artisan workshops that cater to the same audience. Caricatures are also an effective tool to neuter a powerful subject. It disarms and destabilizes the power inherent in the hierarchy. Rather than simply expressing anger toward European aggression in the 19th century, these figures both downplay the political realities that plagued this part of China and imp impacted the lives of people who saw them. They maintain their sense of order in the world with foreigners under control and as bearer of tributes. By, highlight the, but by highlighting the otherness, the Sinocentric self is reasserted and reassured. Finally, 
caricatures are about jokes. And jokes, according to Freud, is always, quote, socially recuperative, end quote. And it is always sheer. It is about reinforcing the self-identity of an audience or a community. If you get the joke, you're part of the community. If you don't, you're out. Next. I would like to end with a somewhat unconventional comparison. On the left, a pair of toshiri of the so-called Blackmore figures from Venice, uh, Venice, Italy, uh, from the late 19th century. And only one of only one example of many manifestations of such stereotypes in the long history of Euro-American decorative arts. On the right, a pair of pewter candlesticks from Guangzhou make for the export market, circa 1850s. So they're roughly contemporary. Both are decorative objects. Both depict people of different ethnicity or race from the artisans who made them. Both depict foreigners holding up stuff. Next. Yet the histories and context that produce each cannot be more different. One was made in the decade when the city of Guangzhou would be occupied by British troops and their own governor <clears throat> uh, taken hostage and eventually would die in India. The other, the latest in the long history of racialized and romanticized stereotype of enslaved people from Africa. One uses one used caricature to naturalize the threat posed by real versions of these foreigners, but with whom the artisans would need to continue to conduct business and therefore would also be seen as harbinger, uh, as bringers of opportunities. The other used by the rich and the powerful, many of whom profited either directly or indirectly from the labor and legacy of the enslaved. The inferiority of the black body was seen, in, especially in the 19th century, by followers of eugenics as a justification of the continual colonial subjugation. Throughout the 19th century, the 20th century, and sadly until today, the same exaggerated black bodies were seen as a source of mockery and thus the affirmation of the superiority of the colonial self. Though these European stereotypes have been outdated for a while in China, the attitude to reify the superiority of the national self remains. Both fundamentally are about the construction of the self through the other. And unfortunately, this dichotomy and way of seeing stubbornly persists into today. Next. Just a way to sort of bring this more to relevance to the topic today. And unfortunately, these type of stereotypes and uh, uh, sort of racist stereotypes about uh, 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 people of, uh, of color uh, is somehow transferred to the contemporary way of seeing uh, seeing the other in China today. Uh, and what is of course ironic is that these type of racist views were often sanctioned by the state, but they were also very much alive in places like Guangzhou, which had a very large uh, uh, sort of community of African traders and uh, sort of racist incident happened almost uh, on a weekly basis there. Next. Else. To end, in writing about blackface, the scholar Nicholas Salmon reflects that, quote, stereotype is not a disavow of their basic humanity in favor, <laughs> is a disavow of the basic humanity in favor of a grossly exaggerated feature 